Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for A Dram of Outlander.com. For all things Outlander from the Dinah Gabardon book series to the Stars TV series and anything interesting that falls between, this is podcast episode 174, week 10 of the Fiery Cross read along, and we are in chapters 17 and 18. Well, hello there. It has been very busy in midwife world. <laughs> And lo, I have stayed behind in the read-along. I'll venture to catch up and I will do my best, but I have no promises. <laughs> so I hope this weekend finds you very well. What has happened in Outlander World this last week is Sam Hewen was able to meet Prince Charles. And he had his birthday, and he had raised, what, almost three million pounds for his charity. It's been very, very busy, as well as it was Jamie Fraser's birthday on May 1st. Mm -hmm. It would have been, what, 289 years old? Quite, yes, quite. Pretty amazing. So we are finally, finally, finally in chapter 17, closing out the longest day ever, ever, ever in a book. We had to get into chapter 17. Yes. <laughs> a most, most interesting 24-hour period. And then we find our way to Fraser's Ridge in the North Carolina mountains. And the summary goes something like this. The gathering and the longest day draws to a close. Jamie ponders the act of surrender. There is a call to duty. The caravan heads to Fraser's Ridge. Jamie happens upon a spirit-filled place. A gift for Claire is picked up amongst the trees. There is fear for what might be found at the ridge. Homecoming is sweet and noisy. A wee posy for Claire. For what is a sponge? Roger gives Brianna something practical and special. It's not a dream. So the setting is the settlement of Fraser's Ridge, North Carolina. It is late October. Early November we're getting into. And a whole host of people will be traveling with Jamie and Claire back to the ridge from the gathering. And some like the bugs, have already gone ahead to get things started along with a few other people. So the characters that are really active for the most part are Jamie, Claire, Roger, and Brianna, um, as well as Gideon the horse. <laughs> and a small cat named Adso. We do see Mrs. Bug and some other people, but they're small little snippets. So as the gathering winds down, we find Jamie unable to sleep. He's listening to the sounds of the last people around the campfire, those going and seeing Archie Hayes and giving him news about what happened in Hillsboro. And the way he's laying in this tent, like we get the idea that Claire would understand that he does not need any tending to at all. He's simply in this quiet, meditative state where he's thinking. And we're not sure if she's asleep or not. <laughs> but he doesn't want her to feel like she has to be awake and doing anything. So Jamie is just taking notice. There's also music in the air and a baby crying. And he hears Marcely singing Alouette, gentil Alouette. And he thinks it's funny that parents sing very grim songs to their children. And he's just kind of drifting and thinking. 
And then Claire perks up during this time and ask, asks Jamie about the men in Hillsboro. Were they wrong? What's right in this situation? None of it's really right. And Claire's trying to get to the bottom of it. And Jamie tries to explain to her that those who are turning the men in are also wrong. And the phrasing is, a mob might rule, but it was single men who would pay the price for what was done. Part of the price was the breaking of trust, the turning of neighbor against neighbor, fear a new squeezing tight until there was no longer any breath of mercy or forgiveness. So though it was a bunch of people, the names that are being given to Archie Hayes, those are the ones that are going to end up paying the penalty for what was done. Because if we're in chapter 17, like I said at the beginning, and this is like the longest day ever. So really, men have only been going into this tent for 24 hours. It's It seems unfathomable that this day could not have been edited down just a bit, right? And we know that we're going to see this day in the TV show, but I can't see that this gathering is going to take more than one episode. And I'm hoping they keep some of the quirky, fun, weird things in it, like Roger and Brianna's encounter that the priest gets arrested, Jamie trying to get the kids baptized. I mean, there's a lot that can be seen in a one-hour show. But it makes me wonder how much they're really going to fit in now that we're 17 chapters in. That is a hunk of book. And this is a very long book. But on my nook, we're sitting at page, if my, 234 already. So it's hundreds of pages in. But they're still having 1,100 pages of text to adapt for, the, for a shorter season for only 12 episodes. That's a lot of pages to squish in. So, and we also know the storylines have taken a different arc because we have Murtaugh to deal with in the TV show, which we don't have here. So that's going to put another layer onto it that has to be dealt with. It's just not simply the Hillsborough riots. There's a target, specific target, which is Murtaugh. Okay. So where do we go from here? So in Jamie's mind, it's moving and wandering, and he's cuddling Claire. And he's thinking about the act of surrender. At first it had happened only when he took her, and only at the last. Then sooner and sooner, until her hand upon him was both invitation and completion— a surrender inevitable, offered and accepted. He had resisted now and then, only to be sure he could. Suddenly fearful of the loss of himself, he had thought it a treacherous passion, like the one that swept a mob of men, linking them in mindless fury. Now he trusted it was right, though. The Bible did say it, Thou shalt be one flesh, and what has God joined, and what God has joined together let no man put asunder. He had survived such a sundering once. He could not stand it twice and live. The sentries had put up a canvas lean-to near their fire to shelter from the rain. The flame sputtered as the rain blew in, though, and lit the pale cloth with a flicker that pulsed like a heartbeat. He was not afraid to die with her, by fire or any other way, only to live without her. There was no world outside the small confine, he told himself. Scotland was gone. The colonies were going. What lay ahead be... What lay ahead he could only dimly imagine from the things Brianna told him. The only reality was the woman held fast in his arms, his children and grandchildren, his tenants and servants. These were the gifts that God had given him, his to harbor, his to protect. That's really Jamie's call to duty. Is It's these people. It's to care for his people. 
And with Claire, she's the one place that he can find and utilize that vulnerability and surrender to her wholly. But it even says that sometimes he tries to hold back. I imagine that we all do that to some degree. Even with those that we are utterly most vulnerable to, we can surrender ourselves over to in trust and love and need. But I get that. I get that needing to know that you can hold back from it. But, you know, he plainly says he could not stand being torn from her again which means for her to die, for her to go back to her own time for any reason to be separate from her would be too much for him. And that's the end of chapter 17. So it was really Jamie's perspective of closing the gathering. What did it mean? Where is it going? What does he have to do? What matters? And Claire was able to just go back to sleep, snuggling up to him. So his purpose is really laid out in front of him. And it's a big daunting task, taking a whole caravan of people by horse up to Fraser's Ridge. It's really not that close. It could be a couple weeks ride. It's going to be November by the time they get back. So now we're in part two, The Chieftain's Call. Chapter 18, No Place Like Home. So Jamie is writing The Devil Horse Gideon. (laughs) The horse has a mood, and it's very strong-willed, and it wants nothing more than to be the one in charge. So Jamie really needs to work with this willful animal. But he's writing Gideon, and at some point... He decides after a week's journey, he's going to run the horse in the mountains. He's going to tire this beast out, who's not tired yet from this long journey. So he decides just to bolt, because he knows where he's at, and the caravan is just going back up to the ridge, with Claire included. So he takes this horse on a jaunt until the horse is tired. Because Jamie wants this horse's disability. (laughs) That is so not the word I was trying to grasp for in my brain. He wants this horse's countenance to come down a few notches and be a little more pliable and compliant. I have no idea what word I was trying to grasp for, but it did not work. So after running this horse up and through and around, they come to this place. And the writing is so beautiful. And this is where Jamie has a sense of spiritual connection He feels a spiritual encounter. He sees someone in this space, and he feels like this is a sacred place. It's interesting because I am going through a book that is set in 500-ish AD, and it's set with the Britons and the the very southern lands near... Hadrian's Wall in that area of Scotland, and there's the Picts and there's the the others who are warring, and it's really the fracturing of the old ways, the old faith, and Christianity clashing and coming and really taking part in politics and who has the power. And I sit here, and it's very humbling, even though it's a historical fiction. I, of course, know Christianity's really tarnished roots. I do. But in the book, 
it talks about the sacred oak trees. It talks about these places where that's where the Druids or the pagans would have their ceremonies. That's where they would go and pray. That's where they would go to on their feast days. And there was a really core part of what the healers could do and what they could learn and those who carried the stories and the knowledge from earlier times, even when they didn't remember the names. And that's where they could listen to the gods, so to speak. And I do think there are places that are utterly sacred. I mean, you can feel it. If you are somebody who is spiritually connected at all, you can feel it. Haven't you been somewhere and you walked into a clearing or walked into a wood and you get to a section and you can almost hear the trees talking. The wind sounds different. The way everything moves feels different worldly. It doesn't feel the same the way the light filters through. I tend to be a very spiritually based person. And I'm a faith-based person, and to me, those go together. I don't believe we need to separate them. And they are very intertwined with how I see the world and how I experience the world. And I'm very spiritually sensitive to all the things. So going through the book that I am currently reading, it is called The Lost Queen by Signa Pike. It's supposed to be a trilogy at some point in time, but it's really fascinating really looking at that clash. And as Jamie comes upon this area and he has the same kind of experience where he's like, this is different. This is sacred. There's something holy. It makes me wonder if it was a place like in the Godswood and Game of Thrones that there was some kind of spiritual force there. This is where somebody came to worship or came to pray or came to listen. I love how Diana writes this section. The breeze was from the west. Jamie lifted his chin, enjoying the cold touch of it on his heated skin. The land fell away in undulating waves of brown and green, kindled here and there with patches of color, lighting the mist in the hollow like the glow of campfire smoke. He felt a peace come over him at the sight and breathed deep, his body relaxing. Gideon relaxed too, all the feistiness draining slowly out of him like water from a leaky bucket. Slowly, Jamie let his hands drop lightly on the horse's neck, and the horse stayed still, ears forward. Ah, he thought and the realization stole over him that this was a place. He thought of such places in a way that had no words, only recognizing one when he came to it. He might have called it holy, save that the feel of such a place had nothing to do with church or saint. It was simply a place that he belonged to be, and that was sufficient, though he preferred to be alone when he found one. Quite suddenly, he had a vision of his mother, one of the small, vivid portraits that his mind hoarded, producing them unexpectedly in response to God knew what, a sound, a smell, some passing freak of memory. He had seen a small grove of trees and gone to them for shade. His mother was there, sitting in the greenish shadow, on the ground beside a tiny spring, she sat quite motionless, which was unlike her. Long hands folded in her lap. She had not spoken, but smiled at him, and he had gone to her, not speaking either, but filled with a great sense of peace and contentment, resting his head against her shoulder, feeling her arm go about him and knowing he stood at the center of the world. He had been five, maybe, or six, and then the vision vanished as quickly as it had appeared. He had been taught some words, and he couldn't remember by who. He spoke the words, though, as he turned himself sunwise, murmuring the brief prayer to each of the four erts in turn, and ended facing west into the setting sun. 
He kept his empty hands, and the light filled them, spilling from his palms. May God make safe to me each step. May God make open to me each pass. May God make clear to me each road. And may he take me in the clasp of his own two hands. With an instinct older than the prayer, he took the flask from his belt and poured a few drops on the ground. To me, this is so beautiful, and Jamie honored the space. He prayed, and then he poured back onto the earth from what had come, which was the holy water of whiskey. (laughs) But he gave back, and he felt a great sense of himself there. And I think any of these type of places really give us that. And there's an immense confirmation of safety, I think, as well. I don't think I've ever felt fearful or worried or concerned in a place like this. And if you haven't ever ventured upon one, I just suggest for you to be open when you are out in nature to see what you might find or hear or see or feel. It's pretty extraordinary. And I think part of that harmony comes from all living things being intrinsically connected and everything that's alive shares DNA. We're all part of the same well of life. I mean, we're all patterned in some way very similarly because we simply are alive and It doesn't matter if you're a person of faith, if you're an atheist, whatever it might be, wherever you are on the spectrum of faith and spirituality, I think everyone can experience this. And this is why people meditate. This is why they will practice yoga and actually practice yoga, or they will do qigong or tai chi or go and spend time in nature. It's very nurturing to us to be around other living things, not just people. That's why I think so many of us love animals to a degree that is ridiculous, almost. I was walking last night with my son. I had been up all night. I think I got a 20-minute nap, hadn't gone to bed, and went to be with somebody having a baby. (laughs) And I was got a three and a half hour sleep when I got finally got home in the early afternoon. And I woke up and didn't know what day it was, what time, you know, it was the whole thing. But I still had to go and move my body. Though I had been very active and I'd had a lot of steps in, I didn't have any active minutes, more than maybe seven minutes that I had been doing something continuously. So I still had to go get that hour in that I need, that my body needs in order to feel strong and healthy. And it had to be something exceedingly gentle. And I knew I could not stay in the confines of my house and be on the stair stepper or the elliptical. I really needed to go outside. So my youngest son went and walked the neighborhood. I'm blessed to have a very beautiful neighborhood and it's hilly. And then we have this gorgeous green space that is not very big, but It's, you know, the small hiking space that takes about 15 minutes to get through, 20 minutes. And it's just connected to my neighborhood. It's really quite extraordinary. But we were able to do that. And we spent about just under 70 minutes outside. It was a trudge and I was so tired. But once we got into the green space, even though my neighborhood has lots of trees, we can have a big view of Pikes Peak. I live in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and... Pikes Peak is kind of our thing. <laughs> and they have this gorgeous snowy peak still. And But once you know we got into our little green space, it just changes. Everything feels and sounds different. And it's a special little unique place that we have just in my neighborhood in the middle of the city. <laughs> I feel really blessed. I mean, I don't have an ocean I can just go to within a couple of hours. So... 
all the places of greenery and trees and trails that I get to go to frequently make me very happy. That really is nourishing to my spirit. But it is different. It's like this, and there's this section that I walk through that has really very tall trees, and it's a little path. (laughs) And especially in the late spring and into summer when everything is all the trees are as full as they're going to get and the the natural grasses get really high. It's so amazing in this little tiny section and the way the light hits it and it just, it is, it's really filled with peace in this one little section and there's a main road really not far. I mean, I can hear the cars, but everything kind of gets dulled in this little area. Um, And yeah, I feel really blessed that I get to walk through it whenever I really want to because it's right around the corner from me, literally. <laughs> and I do find myself, especially when I'm alone and I just have listening to an audio book or whatever, and I do find myself stopping in certain areas and saying a prayer. Even if I don't even know what the words are, I can feel myself saying a prayer even though I don't know what I'm saying, does that make any sense? But, and for Jamie to stop and say this prayer older than all the things, you know, it's an old Celtic prayer, which came well before um, some of the modern faiths that we have. But this is regrounding him before he ends up taking that last, last push up to Fraser's Ridge. And so from here, we find that Jamie notices something out of the kind of the corner of his eye and he sees a tiny little gray kitten that is scared to death of something and all puffed out. Oh, so cute. It's a feral kitty and he goes to pick it up and it bites him. (laughs) And I love this right here. He paused, then made up his mind. He shook the blood drop from his finger onto the leaves and offering to join the dram he had spilled, a gift to the spirits of this place, who had evidently made up their minds to offer him a gift themselves. And so very slowly, he decides to mesmerize the kitten, just like he does horses, and Claire sometimes. (laughs) Because she needs to be... Every once in a while, cooed to and calmed down like he's talking to a horse. (laughs) And so he hypnotizes this little kitty and is able to pick it up. He he says he he can guttle a trout. Why not a cat? (laughs) So Jamie ends up being able to pick up this kitten and puts this kitten in his shirt. And of course, it's climbing on his chest. But the kitty purrs, just happily purrs. Oh, And he decides to go back to Gideon and get back on his way. There's a lot of people in this caravan, and everybody wants to get back, but the horse is just wanting to push on. Just Jamie wants to get back, too. But alas, he has to slow down. <laughs> And Claire was off her horse, and she's picking roots and leaves and, or, you know, plants, doing her thing. And she's holding up everybody else. <laughs> and he's really wants to get home. <laughs> so she, you know, he puts her on the horse, and Gideon's trying to, of course, snap at Claire. <sighs> and they see... Oh, and Claire gets bucked off at the horse. (laughs) And they come across Roger and Brianna, and Roger is giving plants to Brianna. And to Jamie, this looks like Roger's giving Claire a posy. I mean, Roger's giving Brianna a posy. So it's very sweet. But Claire doesn't explain exactly what these plants are yet. (laughs) And 
Claire says that it's very romantic. Jamie still doesn't understand. <laughs> so as they're making their way, Jamie realizes or thinks that the kitten is gone. And he just says a little prayer for it and moves on. But now they're getting close to Fraser's Ridge. And Jamie notices his heart getting faster. And he's apprehensive to come home after being absent for a while. I mean, they've been gone for two and a half weeks. Let's see. One week, two Three, three weeks, maybe a little longer. And the highlands were cleansed after Culloden, and people would come home and crops would be burnt, lands would be burnt out, there would be dead bodies. I mean, so that clearing really did a number on the highlands and the people that live there. So there's a caution in him at returning home. And plus, you have to remember that Brianna believes that the big house and Jamie and Claire are going to die in a fire, right? Of course, in the books, we know the date. So there's that concern. When you smell smoke, is it because the people have been burned out and there's dead everywhere or they've been run off? Is his home going to still be there when he returns? And the other concern in this place, obviously, it's not that the British army is going in and burning things down, but the Indians are there. There's animals. And fire is very dangerous, right? So Fergus guided the bugs before them, like I said earlier, and... There's other people that are there. There's lots of children and livestock. I mean, so they really are coming back from the gathering <laughs> with a fullness on the ridge that they hadn't had before. And Claire notices Jamie's tension, and she says, It's all right. I smell chimney smoke. He lifted his head to catch the air. She was right. The tang of burning hickory floated on the breeze. Not the stink of remembered conflagration, but a homely whiff, redolent with the promise of warmth and food. Mrs. Bug had presumably taken him at his word. They rounded the last turn of the trail and saw it. Then, the high fieldstone chimney rising above the trees on the ridge, its fat plume of smoke curling over the roof tree, the house stood. So this is a great relief to Jamie and to Claire. And they're happy to see that a fire had been made for Brian Roger and the other cabin. Even Gideon was happy that they had arrived back. But the funny thing, and the reason I put on here that the relief of homecoming and Mrs. Bug <laughs> is because she's quite an extrovert, Mrs. Bug, isn't she? And Clarence the Mule greets them and Mrs. Bug comes out, and she does nonstop talking, right? All's well, all's well, and how's yourself, sir? Mrs. Bug was reassuring him before his boots struck ground. She had a pewter cup in one hand, a polishing cloth in the other, and didn't cease her polishing for an instant, even as she turned up her face to accept his kiss on her withered round cheek. She didn't wait for an answer, but turned at once and stood a tiptoe to kiss Claire beaming. Oh, it's grand that you're home, mum, you and himself, and I've the supper all made so you'll not worry it a bit with it, mum. But come inside, come inside, and be taken off those dusty clutes, and I'll send old Arch along to the mash house for a bit of li livery, and we'll... So she's not stopping talking. This woman has not taken a breath. She had Claire by one hand, towing her into the house, talking and talking, the other hand still polishing briskly away, her stubby fingers dexterously rubbing the cloth inside the cup. Claire gave him a helpless glance over one shoulder, and he grinned at her as she disappeared into the house. <laughs> as soon as she could, though, Claire escapes Mrs. Bug, 
and she's going to check on her garden and her herb shed and just kind of doing her own reacquainting with their place, her places on the ridge. And he's simply watching her and paying attention. And he decides to pick Claire a little bit of a wee posy because he lost the gift of the kitten, right? <sighs> and during this time, he notices that a new privy has to be dug. They have lots of new people, and one privy is not going to be enough. So he's making plans. He's missing young Ian terribly. It hasn't been very long. So he comes up to Claire. You know, she has things in her hands, and he calls her Surka, which is Claire and Gallic. And he welcomes her home. And she says, oh. She looked at the bits of leaf and stick again, and then at him, and the corners of her mouth trembled. As though she might laugh or cry, but wasn't sure which, she reached then and took the plants from him, her fingers small and cold as they brushed his hand. Oh, Jamie, they're wonderful. She came up on her toes and kissed him, warm and salty, and he wanted more. But she was hurrying away into the house, the silly wee things clasped to her breast as though they were gold. He felt pleasantly foolish and foolishly pleased with himself. The taste of her was still on his mouth. It was interesting that he would use the name Sorcha, because he never called her that. And he decided he liked the strangeness of Claire, the Englishness. She was his Claire, his Sassanach. And even the word name Claire, but the Gaelic word means light. So, very sweet of Jamie to do that for her. So they're going through lots of different ministrations, and you know Jamie's in leader mode. He's got a lot to do. He's got a plan to leave soon because of the backcountry things going on and start a militia. That's his penalty for the land, right? <laughs> and Jamie comes upon Brianna, and they're talking, and she notices the plants that Jamie gave Claire so happily. And she says, what's that? Oh, no, she notices on his coat that there's something. And a leaf fell free and floated to the ground. Her brows went up at sight of it. You better go and wash, da. You've been in the poison ivy. <laughs> so Claire was so sweet as to not say anything, but that's why she looked at it so interesting. And he, you know, thinks that she was making fun of him for not telling him. And she wasn't making fun of him. She thought it was really sweet. And if she had told him, he'd have taken it away and never given her another one because he'd never given her a posy before. Aw. So she figures that he's probably immune to poison ivy, and they have another talk about immunity and how things work a little bit um, and talk about, you know, Lizzie's illness because you can never be totally cured from malaria, even though she can be in remission. So they're talking through all this stuff and about immunity and antibodies and parasitic infections. Claire was not really ready to do all of that right at this moment, but she did end up getting a new sponge, which sea sponges were the original sponges and you can still get them. They're very effective. They were some of the things used for birth control, as we talked about, or pregnancy prevention when they were soaked in lemon, wine, vinegar, some oils. Uh, and they were used as just like the sponges today with some form of spermicide, right? But the sponge, when she squeezed it out, you know, the sand left it and... There was a little shell in there. (laughs) 
But in between this time period, Jamie's talking about castrating Gideon. And that's the first thing he's going to do to calm that beast down <laughs> and doesn't think it's a job for Claire. You know, he's going to do it. And so he notices the shell at the bottom of the basin and wonders how it gets in there. So Claire explains that the sponge was actually alive and that, that the sponge ate it. <laughs> and she tells him a sponge is an animal or basically a stomach that sucks in water and absorbs everything edible as it passes through. And I love Jamie's like, ah, so that's why Brie called the Baron a wee sponge. They do that. <laughs> yes, they do. And Claire starts thinking about all the parallels of sponges. So besides Jemmy being one, Jamie was also a sponge. I reflected watching him rootal about, completely naked and totally unconcerned about it. He took in everything and seemed able to deal with whatever came his way, no matter how familiar or foreign his experience. Maniac stallions, kidnapped priests, marriageable maidservants, headstrong daughters, and heathen sons-in-law. Anything he could not defeat, outwit, or alter, he simply accepted, rather like the sponge and its embedded shell. Pursuing the analogy further, I supposed I was the shell, snatched out of my own small niche by an unexpected strong current and taken in and surrounded by Jamie and his life. I think that this is the line in the book that says it's Jamie's story. Right here. I'm going to read it again. Pursuing the analogy further, I supposed I was the shell, snatched out of my own small niche by an unexpected strong current taken in and surrounded by Jamie and his life. Caught forever among the strange currents that pulse through this outlandish environment. That right there is the clue that the Outlander book series is Jamie's story. Even though it's about them as a couple, and I feel very strongly about that, it really is. She's pulled into his story, and then we get her perspective and vantage point. This is all about Jamie's time, Jamie's life, Jamie's family, Jamie's pursuits overall. The thought gave me a sudden queer feeling. The shell lay still at the bottom of the basin, delicate, beautiful, but empty. Rather slowly, I raised the sponge to the back of my neck and squeezed, feeling the tickle of warm water down my back. For the most part, I felt no regrets. I'd chosen to be here. I wanted to be here. And yet now and then, small things like our conversation about immunity made me realize just how much had been lost of what I had had, of what I had been. It was undeniable that some of my soft parts had been digested away, and the thought did make me feel a trifle hollow now and then. What do you think about that sec that section right there, that passage, and that Claire had lost so much in this transition? And it's just not the modernity of running water in bathtubs. All the scientific discoveries, the medicine, really surgery, the things that made her who she is, her people, right? Even like Joe Abernathy, the colleagues, what she did, her patients, everything she had worked for. Even Frank, I mean, she lost a lot. But this is where she knew she was supposed to be, but she became part of Jamie's life and Jamie's story. Um, it's pretty compelling, I think. And I don't think it, it's any different than when you get married, missing, being unencumbered <laughs> to some degree. I think we all do. Even if you love being married, even if you're in a great relationship, even if right? It's like becoming a parent. And you can't just leave your kid in a kennel like a puppy with a clock <laughs> to soothe it. All of a sudden, everything changes. It's okay to miss your freedom. And speaking with somebody recently who had just had a baby, there had been kind of a gap in children and 
had to explain to her that it was okay to grieve the loss of freedom and having children who were old enough to do things for themselves. I mean, to be going back to breastfeeding and diaper changes and never being able to be far away. And if she was going to be far away, she would have to find a place to pump and pump ahead at home to make sure there was milk for the baby in case the baby needed it. And it's a lot. It's a lot. I would rue the day I had to go back to that. I mean, my youngest is 17 and a half, but my children are of an age now where I could be having grandchildren at any time, really. I mean, realistically, it can happen any time. And, oh, hell will have no fury like a mother being forced to raise her grandchildren. Like, if that happened, I would be devastated. And it's not going to be that I'm not going to love being a grandmother and loving my grandchildren, but I've done my job. I've raised children. And I am not going to be the grandmother who wants to be waiting on beck and call on my grandkids and only that's my purpose is serving my children and grandchildren continuing down the line in that same way like I do now. I cannot imagine that. It would be very unsettling to me. There's lots of plans. There's lots of things that have been put aside for years because of our choice to have four children. And I'm looking forward to having all adult children. I'm looking forward to grandchildren, but they're theirs to raise. And I hope we're never put in the position to where we have to raise our grandchildren, like we have no choice. I think there can be blessing in that. And I know numerous people who have done it and who do it. And God bless them, each one. I don't know if I have the fortitude for that. I mean, I think there would be lots and lots of resentment And it's not going to be like, oh, I don't want to have my grandchildren for the weekend or take them on trips and do that. That's totally different. But I don't want to be the primary caretaker or caregiver or be the substitute parent for them. And I get it. And there's a lot of kind of a lot of loss and things that we do all the time. It's all about choices and which is the right choice and what's best and who it's best for and and not being a selfish person and how do we combine all those things without losing too much of ourself. And like Claire saying, the soft bits of her had been, you know, absorbed. They've been eaten away and they had. They had. And we have to be very careful that the core of who we are is not dissolved in all the things that we do. So many women completely lose themselves or lose sight of themselves in the years of parenting small children and and then into middle school children and then into teenage children, and they never foster themselves. They lose sight of who they are, what they want, what matters to them. And they think if they're parenting and they're the ones who are the primary caregivers that they can't have those things for themselves. And I don't think that's true. I I don't. I don't believe every mother should stay home with her children. I, If you are a working mother, I think you can make it all work. But it really depends on you. And there's a lot of women who don't necessarily want to go to work after they have children, but they have to because of their financial situation or they're the primary moneymaker in their families. So it all looks different. But In all of it, we have to be very careful not to lose sight of who we are, what we need, what's important to us, what makes us who we are. And historically, even now, I mean, since the beginning of time, men have generally had to lose very little of themselves when pursuing a career, when having a family, when doing all the things that they want to do. The world is kind of their oyster. And they don't have to make the same decisions that we do as women. They don't. And that's the truth. And I don't think they ever will. It doesn't matter how equitable a relationship is or your culture is. It's different. Just being a mother is sacrificial. Just the act of going through pregnancy and bearing children is sacrificial. 
We're literally giving of our body. We're sharing our body with somebody else. There's immense blessing in doing it. I don't regret for a minute becoming a mother. Well, maybe a half a minute, but no, not really. (laughs) I always wanted to have children, but it is. We literally sacrifice our body. We nourish another human inside and out. We have the ability to do so. And yeah, men don't ever have to do that. They don't understand and we do have to give so much of ourselves in ways that men never will. And even men who are the single fathers raising their children, it's it's still different. It's a lot of sacrifice, and it's totally something they're not used to having to do. But it's different. And so, yes, we do have to be careful in these choices and that we don't lose sight and that you find time to nourish yourself and read and fill your cup. It is not selfish to want for yourself as much as you want for your partner or your husband or your uh, children. There has to be space and time that you get that. You know, like in this whole book series, like Jenny reads, you know, and she can read some naughty novels, French novels. (laughs) That's hers. That's her time. She loves, you know, her sheep and she loves certain things. That's hers. It's not just about everyone else. She has something that's her own. And there's things that Brianna does that are her own, that she loves, her art. And so we have to keep that sense of ourself. And Claire remains a physician, but she's looked down upon. She's not looked upon respectfully by many And it's as if she's a hack when she has more skill than most. But she's still looked down on because she's a woman and that she shouldn't be doing these things. So she gave up a lot of status and prestige and things that she worked very hard for. You know, so I really love how Diana writes about these things. And these are common situations to all of us in some capacity. I know women who have to work two or three jobs simply to put food on the table and a roof over their children's head because they're single mothers. What do they ha- They sacrifice everything. There's nothing left for themselves, hardly ever. Maybe when their children are grown. Maybe their children will care for her. But it's so many women really just never recoup it or never have it in the first place, even in our modern world where we think it's so much simpler. (laughs) Modern conveniences do not make the stresses of life and the sacrifices in life any smaller or simpler. So Jamie and Claire end up sharing some of the sacramental wine from Father Kenneth that he came up with. And Jamie's just thinking about the things that are coming. And as he does, he looks at Claire and says, You're in good flesh these days, Sassanach. I mean, and he tells her, You must have gained a stone at least since the spring. Does any woman want to hear that she's put weight on? But, you know, Claire tends to get underweight. Like she tends to get very thin. And Jamie likes her with some meat on her bones. And she's written as being 5'6 and 126 pounds. You know, she has a bosom and she has a bum, so that I can see her English figure, you know. I know exactly what she looks like with narrower shoulders, and she has a finer frame, but she's taller than most in that time period. And I see what she looks like, and it would be very easy for her to, like, lose her behind. (laughs) Because and just get thin, very thin. And then she gets mad at him for saying that, you know, it's been a good fat summer. (laughs) But he likes her plump like a hen. And he doesn't really get to see her naked very often recently because of how things are. And she's really offended by that. And it's interesting to see this vanity in Claire. Like she had to go to Joe Abernathy before 
she went back to Jamie to make sure she was still looked good. Like she wasn't sure when she had sex appeal still, you know, and she really wanted a man's opinion on that. <laughs> and it matters to her that she's pleasing. I think we all have those insecurities. And now she's, you know, she's in her fifties that that's something to be concerned with. And there are challenges that come with being middle-aged Apparently, Claire is very little touched by those, unlike some of us, but she still has that same insecurity. And then because Jamie's walking around naked, she has that visual reminder that, yes, he thinks she's cute. <laughs> and it makes her say, oh, well, well then, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... She goes to finish washing and make sure that he washes because she doesn't want poison ivy, and he did. He used lye soap, and he's clean. <laughs> so after word, she's asking, like, why would he do a posy? Because he'd never done one before, and he'd had. A, he tells her he'd had a gift for her, but it got lost, and he had noticed Roger giving Brianna the weeds. <laughs> And so Claire has to really explain that Roger wasn't really being romantic at all. Or she says, or maybe he was, depending how one wants to look at it. Jamie's kind of confused, and Claire goes on to explain that Granny Bacon gave her some seeds that she says the Indians use for contraception, and they're supposed to be really effective. And those were the plants that Roger found. I love how he says, Birthcon, what? She, you mean he, those clotty weeds? Well, yes, or at least I think they may help prevent pregnancy. <laughs> and Jamie's concerned by this, and he's wondering, why don't they want to have another baby? <laughs> it's only, does it not seem a bit strange to you, Sassanok, that a young woman newly wed should be thinking of such a thing? No, it doesn't, I said rather sharply. It seems entirely sensible to me, and they aren't all that newly wed. They've been. I mean, they have got a child already. His nostrils flared in soundless disagreement. She has a child. That's what I mean, Sassanok. It seems to me that a young woman well suited with her man would not be thinking first thing how not to bear his child. Are you sure all is well between them? So Clary considers this, and she thinks so. Remember, Jamie, Brie comes from a time where women can decide whether or when to have babies with a fair amount of certainty. She'd feel that such a thing was her right. So now Jamie is thinking, and this is where I love about their relationship where they subtly can challenge each other, and he's willing to take in new information that's very, very modern. I mean, it's 200 years Past him. <laughs> For society. <laughs> That's the way of it then. A woman can say, I will or I won't, and the man has no say in it. He's like surprised and he doesn't agree with it and she laughs. So Claire again has to go on and say there are accidents and ignorance and foolishness. A lot of women just let things happen, and most women would certainly care what their men thought about it. But yes, I suppose if you come right down to it, that's right. And she assures him that Roger's from the future, too, so he wouldn't think it was strange at all. And he picked the weeds for her. And this also makes Jamie start to think, hmm... And then Claire tells him that Marcelie had asked for birth control before she got married to Fergus. <laughs> I love this because they have two babies. And he says, did you not tell her then? <laughs> so Claire says the concern was more about having a child and making it so she didn't enjoy having sex with Fergus. And when it was fine, then it was okay to have more kids and not use the birth control. <laughs> so that's why 
And so then this kind of makes Jamie start to think, oh. And then, you know, they talk about the birth control pill. And he asks Claire why she didn't bring more. Why didn't she bring them for herself? And because even though it's not likely that Claire would get pregnant at her age, she still could. And especially when she hadn't been, I mean, now she's been around Jamie for a while, but especially immediately upon her return, it could have kicked her cycles back into gear and she could have had a bout of pretty serious fertility, uh, even at her age, even at 50, because they hadn't seen each other. And, you know, she really likes Jamie. (laughs) And her ovaries and uterus could have gone in unison with that and really liked Jamie. So she could have easily or fairly easily gotten pregnant um, because she's still cycling. If she had completely gone through menopause, no. But given her where she's at in the process, she could have gotten pregnant. And so now they go in this conversation from why did you give me a posy to why didn't you – bring pills with you, Claire, so you wouldn't get pregnant. So she had thought about it. She was very honest. And then she explains to him that there is an operation that she could have had to make her totally sterile, which is a tubal ligation, and that she'd really thought about it. And here's what he says to her. For God's sake, Claire, tell me that you did it. Wow. I mean, that's a big deal, especially from someone who is a faithful Catholic, someone who has a deep faith and is deeply spiritual. And she said that she would have told him. And she was surprised that he would have wanted her to. He doesn't want any more children. He just needs her. That's all he wants. <laughs> that's, he doesn't need anything else. He has enough in his life. And so they had talked about it, and she didn't want to do anything without him knowing, but of course she can't do a tubal ligation in that time. And she said she didn't think he'd ever see Brianna. He didn't know, she didn't know about Willie, and why would she take away the chance of him not being able to have another child if he wanted to, not without telling him? And especially in her, at her age, that's a big deal for her to want to consider that. So I like that. I like that communication between them. It's really difficult. It's funny that she's been back for as long as she has, years, and now they're having this conversation, though. So sometimes she just doesn't say things. (laughs) Even when that was her whole intention, and this has been years now she's been there. Years. I mean, heck, Brianna and Roger have been there for over a year. (laughs) So it's a long time for something that they never discussed. Either of them, which is fascinating to me. Like, Jamie didn't ask her if she brought something from the future that could prevent babies. So they just kind of, like, hoped for the best. (laughs) And he tells her he's going to pick her another another posy tomorrow (laughs) and that Roger and Brianna are fine. It's great. So they're sleeping now and she's having this dream um, that like little fingers needed her breast and then she gets bitten and she thinks it's a rat and there's this whole hullabaloo row and Jamie jumps out of bed and she asks him if he's talking to the rat I waited with some impatience. Within a minute, he made a grab, evidently catching whatever it was, for he gave a small exclamation of satisfaction. He stood up, smiling, a gray, furry shape clutched by the nape, dangling like a tiny purse from his fingers. He is your wee ratten, Sassanok, and he gives her this little ball of gray fur. And she's overcome. Well, goodness, wherever did you come from? She touches the little kitten and it starts to purr. That is the present I meant to give you, Sassenach. He'll keep the vermin from your surgery. Well, possibly very small vermin. I think a large cockroach could carry him. Is it a him? 
off to its lair, let alone a mouse. He'll grow. Look at his feet. Oh. So she loves this little kitten. Oh. Because of the noise in their room, Mr. Weems comes by and it's fine. He checks in on them. And Claire says Jamie looks like a woolly mammoth and they talk about ancient elephants. <laughs> And, of course, he's thinking of the elephant's trunk. And Claire's like, that's not what I was talking about. Stop shaking it. Move along. (laughs) So they get back to the kitten, and he has some cream. And he's a good purring kitty. And she asks where he got him from. And he was found in the wood. And he thought he'd lost him when Gideon bolted. But he must have crept into the saddlebags. Oh, so cute. So Jamie's going to have to be leaving in a week, and they're kind of talking about that, and Claire's going to go with him, and they're looking at history, and she doesn't know all the details, but Brianna might know more and all of those kind of things. And then they come back to the cat. What name shall it be? And he said his mother had a cat that looked similar, and his name was Adso. And she's never heard of that name before. And Adso was a rare mouser and was very fond of Jamie's mother. And so where did that name come from? Is it a saint? Claire asks. I was used to the peculiar names of Celtic saints from U. To any other name. And she says, probably St. Anso, <laughs> the patron saint of mice. Not a saint, a monk. My mother was very learned. She was educated at Leach, Yaken, along with Colum and Dougal, and could read Greek and Latin and a bit of the Hebrew, as well as French and German. She didn't have so much opportunity for reading at Lollybrock, of course, but my father would take pains to have books fetched for her from Edinburgh and Paris. So, There was a book written by an Austrian, and the monk's name was Adso of Milk. (laughs) A slit of green showed as when I opened, as though in response to the name, then it closed again, and the purring resumed. Well, if he doesn't mind, I suppose I don't, I said, resigned. Adso, it is. (laughs) So we have these wonderful animals in this these chapters. We have Gideon, who is just like from hell. We have Clarence, who just lovingly greeted them on the way back. And now we have Adso, the new kitten that is going to be Claire's mouser. But Adso is also going to be a touchstone for Claire because you know they never stay in one place too long. Like Jamie has to leave very soon. And they're going to be leaving within the week and Claire's going with him. Um, Roger's going with them. Brianna can't go because of the baby. And she's going to be kind of left in charge with, with Joseph Weems. I'm sorry, Archie Bug. And they're going to have to get things in order. But I love the animals. I love how spirituality was tangled through here. And we still have that storyline of what are we doing about these regulators in the back country. So... We have layers of relationship that we're seeing. We have questions between them, but that just honesty and vulnerability. But it's so funny that in that honesty that it would be years before Claire would talk about maybe Jamie wanting another baby. I mean, now she's in her mid-50s. That's a long time. And Jamie's, you know, about 50. I mean, he's about four and a half years younger than her in the books. So it's quite a bit. I mean, that's a long time to be playing roulette with your fertility, but she still has her cycles, you know, and now that I'm almost 52, I'll be 52 at the end of the month, I keep thinking, oh, Lord, thank goodness my husband got fixed because the idea of any time getting pregnant in the last 10 years was a ludicrous idea. And I'm a midwife and I'm like, oh, no, (laughs) there's still a small possibility I could get pregnant. That's the really frightening thing. Uh, so I definitely look forward to this process being complete. But Claire is still in this process, so 
lots of time. So the next couple of chapters will be 19 and 20, and we will talk a little bit about the things that have come in from season five starting to film and everything that's going on there. We have no idea of a release date for season five. Um, season four will have its release. The DVD release is coming up soon. And tonight there's going to be a little snippet behind the scenes for season five before the Spanish princess airs on stars. I plan on watching that series. It's going to be good, but I'm actually going out of town tonight, so I won't be watching it this evening. And the other bit of news to come up with is programming from Denver Pop Culture Convention is the Outlander out fan panel is going to be Sunday, June 2nd at 2 p.m. in room 603. So if you're going to the Denver Pop Culture Convention, that's when my panel will be. And unfortunately, Karen Doherty, Outlander Medicine, um, will not be able to attend, but Courtney from Outlander Behind the Scenes will be there. And we'll be talking to you and answering questions and discussing the last season, discussing the fiery cross, where we think things are going, etc. So we hope to see you there. So that's very, very exciting that that's happening. And I just want to thank all of you who support the podcast by sharing it uh, financially through patreon.com slash a dram of outlander for those who have sent, you know, sent me a check in the mail to support the running of the podcast. I thank you tremendously. And there are so many changes going on, and I hope that we can just diligently get through this book. And I'm so glad to be with you today. And I thank you for listening, and I appreciate you all. And I would ask that you would please go into iTunes through Apple Podcast and give a five-star rating if you like the show because it helps people find me and it brings more listeners and it elevates the podcast when searches are done. And you can also go into Spotify and Google Play and all the other streaming services and rate the show as well. You can also find A Dram of Outlander on Facebook. There's the Dram of Outlander page. But the A Dram of Outlander group is really where you want to be. You have to ask to join. But this is where some awesome conversation happens every day. You guys interact with each other. And I have Patricia and Jen who are awesome at being co-admins and moderators and really keep the conversation going. And they each bring something different to the A Dram of Outlander community party. <laughs> And on Twitter and Instagram, it's Dram of Outlander without the A in the front. And of course, the website is a dram of com. So I hope you are all having a fantastic week. And if you are under the weather, I pray that you are better. And thank you so much for joining me. Until next time, Slangeva.